Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Anthony. I'm the one that's killing it, apparently. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Go on, go on, go on. I haven't said anything yet. It could go all downhill today. So, um, <laughs> where we have to go there. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I'm super excited to continue this conversation. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Anthony. Uh, I, I'm just really enjoying going through this message. This series is called Remix. Why are we calling it Remix? Well, it's really, it's all about, uh, a remix is giving something a new beat, right? It's giving something a new look. We're not recreating anything new. We're just going back and, and, and giving it another shot, giving it another look. And that's what a remix is. And ultimately, what we're remixing here in this is, is the church, right? This thing called the church. Jesus Christ created this thing called the church, and somewhere along the line, we, we, we missed this incredible message that has continued to change lives, that has continued to change the world. Um, but when it first started, when the early church began, it, it was catching on like wildfire. I mean, people were coming to know who Jesus Christ was, and it was, it was, it was literally changing lives. It was changing nations. It was changing communities. And so we wanted to go back to that. We wanted to find out what it was about the early church, what it was about the beginning of this thing called the church that, that, that was exciting and that was fun. And, and, and so we're going back. We're going back to our core beliefs, our core fundamentals of what we, not only we as Hoboken Grace believe the church should be, but what Jesus Christ said the church should be. And so Justin said it earlier, we say it every single week, we've been given this mission and our mission is to help people find their way back to God. And we got that verse from Acts. Uh, Acts 1727, which says his purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. And there's no better book to look at than the book of Acts because it chronicles the beginning of this thing called the church. And so we're going back and we're looking, what was it? What was it that was changing the world? What was it that was making people so excited and, and fun and, 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 and literally dancing and changing? And, and, and people were coming to know it in record numbers. Because if we think about it today, the first thing we think about in church doesn't necessarily, we don't think fun. We don't think exciting. We don't think dancing. We, we, we and, and, and ultimately, that's our fault. We should be some of the most fun. We should be some of the most loving people in the entire world. We've got this incredible message of Jesus Christ. And yet somewhere along the line, we miss the mark. And if we think about it, where did it go? I mean, not, you know, not to knock anybody here, but I, I, I don't think many of us go like, you know what, Saturday night, I cannot wait to go out with my church friends. You're, you know, you're gonna love meeting them. They're really, really great. At the core, that's who we should be, but it's not. So where did we get it wrong? Where did we miss the mark? I think about, you know, there are some people, though, that get it. There are some people that you meet, and you've met them right here at Hoboken Grace, and you may have met it at your home church. If this isn't what you call your home church, you may have met them, or they just, they seem to exude this, right? They just, they just seem to understand they've got this incredible message. They welcome you in. They bring you apart. You feel like you're part of the family no matter what. When I was, I, I went to, uh, uh, when I walked into this relationship with Jesus, I was in Montgomery, Alabama going to graduate school. And uh, I went to this little church and my dad helped me to find this church online when, when I was looking for one. And, and they had what was called a, a parking lot greeter. I'd never seen this before. We don't have it here. We don't have a parking lot. You can barely park in Hoboken. Um, and so, so there was no need for that here. But, I, but, but in some churches in America, they have what's called parking lot greeters. And there was this dude, he was standing with a big yellow um, vest, and he was like waving people in. And I remember turning into the, uh, into the parking lot, and he was like, he was waving me in. And I was like, that, this is too soon. Like, I haven't even gotten the building yet. I, I got nervous, and I was like, I'm just making a U-turn. And I left. I literally... I drove out uh, and, and I, I circled the block three times until he went in and, uh, and then I sneaked into the parking lot. Uh, just wasn't ready for that. I wasn't ready for the connection. wasn't ready for the commitment. And then I walked in the door, you know, kind of sheepishly and, and hoping, you know, the service had already started and so I wouldn't really have to connect with anybody. And sure enough, there he was in his bright yellow uh, vest, and he's like, oh man, I missed one. And he's like, come on in. Um, 
I found out his name was Earl. Uh, Earl was a really nice guy, and Earl just started introducing me to people. He was like, this is Zelda, this is Candy. I was like, does anybody have a normal name here? I mean, uh, and he was like, he's like, oh man, where are you from? What are you doing? And I was like, this is, can I, can I, can I breathe? Can I sit down? I don't even know if I want to stay here. This guy's asking me all these questions. And so I told him, I was like, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in graduate school. I'm, I'm studying at the Shakespeare Festival. And he's like, Shakespeare. And literally for the next two years, that's what everybody called me at this church. He was like, come on, Shakespeare. Um, <laughs> and I was like, all right. And, and they introduced me to these, to the artsy couple. They're like, we got these two that you need to meet. They're different. Uh, and, and they brought him on down. And there's like, this guy, he speaks your language. You know, she, she did pottery and arts and crafts and he played the bongos. They were interesting. Um, but they came, they became, they were, they were wonderful people. They brought me in. They, they treated me like one of their own. They invited me over for dinners. They used to call me their honorary son. I mean, I just, I, as, as over the next two years, I would grow not only in my relationship with God, but really to love these people. And, and, and they were just such a cast of characters. I mean, they were, they were just so, so interesting. I mean, and, and there was, these are real people, Candy and, and and Tullus and, and, and Chap. I mean, these are all their real names, but they were, they were incredible people. And I think about that. I think about that often. I don't think, you know, it's, I, I may not remember all the, the messages or the sermons. I, I really don't. I, I don't remember the building. I, I don't remember the, 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 the food or the coffee, but what I remember is the people. And, and maybe for you, you, and I hope your experience has been like that when you've walked in through here, that you've, that you've encountered people that have just, you know, that, that, that seem to understand this message of Jesus Christ, and they, they welcome you in, and they bring you in, and they are fun, and they are loving, and you, just, you love to be around them, and you love to bring a part of them, because essentially that's what we're, that's what we're supposed to be, and that's what Jesus Christ called us to do when we've got this incredible message for people. And in fact, this thing called the church right? This thing was never meant to be a building. It was always, it is always meant to be a people. Uh, one of the things we talk about in, in Starting Point, which is, which is one of our short-term groups, um, we talk about kind of, you know, the launching point of this thing called the church. And there's this scene in, in Matthew, in the book of Matthew, and Matthew chronicles it in his, in, in his gospel. And he's talking about, uh, you know, the, the Jesus and his disciples are, are, are about 150 miles north of Jerusalem. They're kind of cast out at this point. They're already outcasts. They've already kind of started to make waves. And, and uh, you know, the people are getting word that these Jesus followers are, are, are creating ruckus. And they're doing everything they possibly can to kind of fan, you know, get them out of there. And so they're about 150 miles north of Jerusalem, which is where the temple's at. And, 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 and they're kind of hiding out in this stuff. And Jesus um, looks down over the, the city of Caesarea Philippi, and, and he sees this incredible city, which, I mean, it's, you can still go there today, but it's, it's not much, but it was this incredible city back in the day. And, and, and he turns to, to his disciples and, and he asks them this question. And maybe you, you, you're aware of this question. He, he basically says, who do you, who, who, who do people say that I am? It's found in Matthew 6, um, 16 verses 13 through 18. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is, right? And we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Some, a lot of the time, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. Uh, so he's basically saying, who do people say that I am? They replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He's like, okay, that's great. But what about you? He asked, who do you say that I am? And in verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was most not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So he's like, who do you think I am? Who do you think I am? This little conversation is going back and forth. And Peter says, I know who you are. You are, you are the Messiah. I think you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, absolutely. Peter, you got it right. And then he says this phrase in verse 18, on this rock, I will build my church. Now, there's something you need to know about this. All right, Jesus likely spoke in Aramaic, right? But the New Testament, when Matthew wrote, sat down to chronicle the life of Jesus, the New Testament was written in Greek, okay? And so uh, a little language lesson here. The, what he said when he was talking about, I will build my church, when Matthew was writing this down, he chose this Greek word, which means, uh, which is called ekklesia. Everybody say ekklesia. 
Look at that. You all speak Greek now. Look at that. Um, and so what does that mean? This is a Greek term. It's a very common Greek term. This wasn't a church term. This wasn't a religious term. It means literally gathering, assembly, or congregation. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to build my gathering, all right? And, and, and they're, a little bit, they're a little bit like, okay, Jesus, I don't really understand what you mean. We're 150 miles north of Jerusalem. I don't really know, uh, I don't really know how you're going to build this gathering. We're kind of uh, outlaws. We're out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but, but Jesus is like, I'm going to build my assembly. And here's the issue. Here's what happened. There was something lost in translation, okay? We, we, we took it, the, the Greek New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Apostle Paul, they all, they all wrote it in Greek, and then when it was translated from the Greek, the word ecclesia wasn't translated uh, correctly. Uh, and, and, and we got this, I think it was the, they said it was the German word. The German word is, is, is where we get the word church. And the German translation of that, the, the word church, the translation is house of the Lord, which is where we get confused there. So unfortunately, in this, this this translation issue, right? We have, we have gone to think that this, that, that this word church actually means the house or the building of the Lord. But the problem is, is that that's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, I'm not going to build a building. He's like, I'm going to build a people. I'm going to build a gathering of people. And that's why, and we've been looking at the Great Commission for the last few weeks, right? This, this mandate that, that after Jesus has died and after he's been resurrected, this mandate that he gave to his followers where our mission of helping people find their way back to God is derived from, right? This ultimate mission of God. And he says in the Great Commission, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and me, uh, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he's saying, all right, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to build, he says earlier on, he says, I'm going to build my gathering of people. And now I want you to go. I want you to go into the world to my disciples, and I want you to start to build this gathering. And so the disciples took what Jesus Christ said, they went into Jerusalem, all right, and they began. And if you look at the book of Acts, we're talking uh, first, second, and third chapters of Acts, this group of people who had watched Jesus die, who had seen him resurrected, who had heard him say, go to all the nations, go into the city of Jerusalem, and suddenly this movement started. And in, in, in these accounts in the book of Acts, it tells us that it starts with the hundreds and that eventually thousands came to know who Jesus Christ was. And there was this incredible thing. And that is where the church was born. And this is why it's important to understand that that, 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 that we need to understand, yes, the church isn't a building, that he predicted a gathering of people and not a building. But second, we need to understand that the people that he chose to launch his gathering to, these weren't, these weren't angels. These weren't 12 perfect people, right? I know a lot of the times we name churches after these disciples and everything like that, and, and, and we've, 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 we've canonized them and we've, we've made them saints. These guys were not saints, okay? These, I mean, I mean, these people, Peter, who, who, Peter lacked faith, right? This is the one who, who got the answer right. But later on, we see not only does he lack faith throughout his, his company with Jesus, he would go on to deny who Jesus was when it mattered the most. He would, he would argue with Jesus, right? I mean, I mean these were guys. These, these were people who, who fought. They argued. They, they tried to one-up one another. They fell asleep while praying. Guilty. I mean, I mean... Oh, come on. You've all done it before. Um, uh, no, I was just pausing. Um, <laughs> wrong. Um, so it says, my point is, this cast of characters, this, this group of people, this cast of characters at my church in Alabama, this cast of characters that are here, these, the cast of characters that you come across, right? Th these are the people that God has chosen to, to, to be this gathering of his people. He's given us to one another. And, and here's the thing, guys, we all have issues. Everyone's, everyone's a little weird. Nobody's better than anyone else, but we all pretend like it is, right? We all, we all, we all, we all post on social media that our lives are better than they actually are. We all try to be healthier and, and, and kinder than we really are. And, and, and at the core of it, we're all a little bit weird. And, and this, is something, this is something we need to understand about what Jesus predicted. He said, yes, there, there, there's going to be a people. There's going to be a people that naturally starts to form, but there's also this longing that happens. No matter how messy, no matter how weird, no matter how bizarre people are, we still have this yearning to 
connect with each other. We have this need to be in community and, 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 and community with each other and community with God as he made us. This doesn't just go away because people are weird, right? We get it from an early age, right? Think about this, right? My daughter now is, is getting to the age where she's reaching for things and she does this adorable thing that when I come home, she gets all excited and she starts reaching for me and I'm like butter, right? And I'm like, oh, whatever you want. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm in trouble when she gets older. She'll be like, dad, and I'll be like, yes, here's my wallet. Um, but, but, um, but even as children, we have this instinctual desire to connect, to be held, and, and, and it's not just a church thing, all right? For those of you who are up here going, oh, yeah, I'm sure there's, there's a des- desire amongst, you know, church people to be in connected and all that stuff. I, and I was like, you know what? I knew you were going to say that. And so I found this quote from this guy from Harvard, all right? Not a church guy, all right? But this is what he says, right? It says, although our culture is focused on achievement, it is not our accomplishments that sustain us. It is the connections we make along the way. And what are these connections? They are the feelings of being part of something that matters, something larger than ourselves. And Jesus understood this. Jesus knew this. This is, Jesus knew that there was a power when his people came together. And listen, I know it's messy, and I know it can be scary, and we have this fear of being hurt, and we have this fear of, of losing our freedom, and, and, and so what do we do? We naturally, we withdraw. We, we hide behind our phones. We, we scroll, and we scroll, and we scroll. But the thing is, is isolation doesn't work either. It doesn't. I mean, you, here's the truth. You didn't get here by yourself. I was raised by Julie and Steve Reimer, right? I, I didn't get here where I am, right? I, I mean, you even look at the, the circumstance that brought me here, right? Dana and I got engaged. She was already here, so I came here. So if you have a problem with me being here, it's her fault. Um, <laughs> And, 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 and but it's the truth. Like, we're not merely put on this earth to amuse ourselves. We're not put on this earth to please ourselves. This is at the core of what God made us to connect. Connection is such a big part. He made us to connect with him. He made us to connect with others. And and the truth be told is we cannot be this gathering of people. We cannot be this church that Jesus Christ predicted without connection. We believe this so strongly here at Hoboken Grace that we may even overuse the word connection. Okay? We call them connection points. We have connection cards. We have them connection events. This is such a huge part of who we are. And this is one of the core values of who we are. Right? We've been going through the core values here each and every week. We've been going back to the fundamental beliefs of, of when we, we started Hoboken Grace and we saw this thing of what the church was supposed to be and, and we came across this, this connection and it was undeniable that Jesus Christ, that God was calling us to connect with him and connect with others. It was impossible to carry out this mission of helping people find their way back to God if we didn't connect with him and if we didn't connect with one another. So we made it our fifth core value, our fifth core value, connection is said like this, connection, God is restoring the connection that all of creation once shared. We join him in this restoration as we experience him restoring our connection to himself and to one another. And so here's, here's, here's what happened. When we look at the world around us, when we look at the world around us and we see all of this stuff happening, we realize that this, this is a shadow of what it was created to be. God didn't create it to be this way. Everything you see, everything you want to see in the world, God wants to see as well. God isn't oblivious to the suffering. There's nothing that God has missed. He created us. He created us to exist in this this perfect harmony, in this perfect unity in this creation, in, in, in connection with him and connection with one another, the, the Hebrew word that they use is called shalom. Right, you're getting a real language lesson today. This is the way the world was meant to be, harmony, living in unity. But at the core of this, God gave us, God gave us free will. He gave us the ability to choose. And we, we didn't choose shalom. Because we chose to believe that God was holding out on us. We didn't choose this perfect unity. We didn't choose this connection with him. We chose ourselves. 
And, and the problem with this is, is that we severed that connection to begin with. You know, people often ask me, well, well, you know, why did God give us free will? And the best answer I've ever gotten that I've ever heard of this is that, well, do you, do you want to be forced to love anyone? And so he gave us the, this free will, the ability to choose. And the problem is we didn't choose God. We chose ourselves in the process. We severed that connection. And, 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 the world, and, and then we realized the world wasn't created this way. And when we pull away from connection, when we pull away from community, that's when things go awry. I mean, I think about it in terms of recovery, and, and even when I was going through process and steps of recovery, I mean, you think about this when it comes to walking with somebody, right? The, the most powerful thing when it comes to recovery is being accountable with one another and being with one, one another, and that's the steps that you take towards recovery and restoration. It's the way things were supposed to be. We were supposed to be so perfect unity with God, and we were supposed to be in so perfect unity with one another. That's how he created the world to be. But when we decided that we were going to go our own way, that's when we started to sever the connection. And there's this incredible thing. If you got to go back to the beginning of the church, you got to go back to the beginning, right? You got to go back to Genesis 1. And, and, and even if you've never, you know, if you're not a churchgoer, you've never even picked up the scriptures, you, you, you might have tried at one point to sit down and, and you're right, I'm going to open up my scriptures and I'm going to read Genesis 1 and I'm going to look at the beginning. And, and you really tried. You really tried to get through Genesis and you got to like Genesis 10 and you're like, I have no idea what's going on. What else is on Netflix? You know, I mean, you, we, we get through this and we understand that in the beginning, right, we, we've gone through through chapter one. And in the beginning, there's something very interesting. In the beginning, in the beginning, in the creation, right, in the creation narrative, you see this pattern. God created this, and it was good. God created the heavens and the earth and the lights, and it was good. He created the animals, and it was good. He created this, and it was good. And there's this, this repetition of it. It was good, and it was good, and it was good. And then God creates man. God creates man, he decides to, to extend this shalom, this perfect unity, this perfect harmony, extend his family, extend his image, create man in his image, and extend this love. And he says in Genesis 2, 18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. See, God creates man in his own image. God looks at man who bears his likeness and says, that's not good. Everything has been good up to this point, but the first time he says things are not good, he sees man by himself. And here's what we need to understand. Sin hadn't entered the world yet. We were still in perfect shalom. We were still in perfect unity. So the fact that God looked at us and said, it is not good for them to be alone. He decides to create and extend that love and create man. And he knows that from the beginning, in order to exist in that perfect shalom, in order to exist in that peace, in order to exist in that unity, we have to be connected with God and we have to be connected with other people. We have to be connected with one another. And God says this aloneness is not good. And sometimes... When, when we're, you know, when we're talking to people and, 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 and we tell them, you know, you know, well, you know, if they're going through a hard time with, with in a relationship or something and we say, you know, you know, we, we tell them not to expect too much from human relationships, that they're inside of every human being is a, is a God-shaped void that, that, that no person can fill. And, and that's true. And that's true. But, but if, we, if we look at what they're saying in, in the book of Genesis, that God creates, that God has created inside of man this human-shaped void that even God God himself cannot fill. There's no substitutes to, to fill this need in human relationship. He's saying not achievements, not money, not busyness, not books, and not even God himself. He was alone, and that was not good. We were created to connect, and we long to be connected because it's written in the very soul. It's written in the very nature of who we are. We can't deny it. We initially reach out because it's written on who we were created to be. 
It's God's desire for your life. Again, all you skeptics out there, right? I was looking at another Harvard study because apparently I got time on my hands. This is crazy, right? There's this Harvard study, right? People with bad health, bad health habits, right? Such as smoking, poor eating habits, obesity or alcohol use, right? Um, but, strong, but, but, but if they had strong social ties, they lived significantly longer than people who had great health habits but were isolated. You know what that means? It's better to eat Twinkies with good friends than broccoli alone. I'm just saying, just saying, just saying. I'm just saying, science dropped, boom. But that's what it says. Like we were, we, yet, yet we, we, we see this written in our hearts. We see this written in our story. We see this written in our DNA. Yet we're, we're becoming increasingly, increasingly disconnected from one another. We're so divided, and, and this level of community has come to the lowest point in our, in our lifetimes. And this isn't what God intended. This isn't what Jesus Christ intended his gathering, his people to be. What you may not know is Jesus prayed for you. He prayed for you. Anybody that would be his disciples, he says in John 17, 20, my prayer is not for them alone. He's talking about the people that were with him. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So these are the guys that are going out. They're going to Jerusalem. They're telling the people. And as they continue to tell the message, he's telling all his believers, verse 21, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you have gave me, that they may be as one as we are one. I am them and you in me so that they may be brought into complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. He's saying, God, as you and I are one, my prayer is that they will be one, that they'll understand that they are in this together, that they will realize that you and I are one, and that my prayer is that they will, that they will understand that they are in this together. And as the result, as the result, you and I are so in tune with what Jesus Christ has called us to do, that we're all on the same mission, that we're all understanding that we're called when we walk into this relationship with Jesus to help people find their way back to God, that, that when we're all on the same mission and that when we have this unity together and that we're being connected with God and we're being connected with one another. He's saying, my prayer is that these people will be so connected with me. They'll be so connected with one another that people will believe. Basically, if we get this right, people will start to believe. If we get this right, people will start to believe in ways that they could never even imagine. People that were never interested in God, people that never picked up the scriptures, people that had been hurt by the church, people that had terrible church experiences, people that didn't believe God at all, that he's saying, listen, when they're exposed to a cast of characters, right, they don't have anything right right? I mean, they don't have everything, right? They're not perfect. They're far from perfect, but they're doing life together. They're on the same mission. And that because of that, because of that, people will start to come to know who God is. We have been given this incredible opportunity. And so many of us say we want to grow deeper in our relationship. We want to understand who God is. You can't do that on your own either. We have to be going and doing life together in order to make this possible. If we want to change this city, if we want to change this nation, if we want to change this world, we have to understand that this is at the core of what Jesus Christ is calling us to do, that we can't do this alone. Those of you who were like me, who come in afterwards and you don't want to connect with anybody, I am so glad that you are here. I am so glad that God has brought you in here, but he's telling you to walk into that too. And just as Pastor Chris said, before we started today, we create these groups, not just because, not, not just because they're fun, but that because it's at the core of who we were created to be. If we can connect with one another, if we can connect those that are outside and we can connect them with God, then we grow this incredible thing that Jesus predicted, this incredible thing that brought people to come to know him in incredible and powerful, powerful ways. It's possible and not only is it possible, it's how we return to that perfect shalom, to that perfect unity, to the way that God created this world to be. If there's something in your heart and you look outside in that world and you go, you know what? Something's not right. At the core, we need to be people who pursue connection because we want people to experience community so that people will come to know who Jesus Christ is, so that we can go back to what God created this world to be. 
which is that world of harmony that we're living in unity and bringing people to know who he is. It's possible. It's been done before. And I don't know of any other time in history that it needs to be done, but today. So if it's on your heart of whether or not to jump into a group in this fall, God is calling you to that right now. Go on the app or, or go online, talk to the connection points. We, we, can't, we can't wait anymore. The world is only going to continue to keep broken unless we, his people, decide to come together and say, you know what? It stops. It starts to change right here, right now. Will you pray with me? Father, oh, there's just so much. <laughs> There's just so much here, and, and we could talk for forever, but, but the, the key point here is that, God, we want people to be in connection with you. And what you've taught us is that the best way to do that is to be in connection with one another, to not shy away from connection, to not shy away from community, but to pursue it and create it at all costs, that we, that we at all costs pursue you and pr- pursue that unity, and pursue that in one another. Father, my prayer is for those who are here today who have not put their faith and trust in you yet, that you on their heart will let them know that you're calling them back to this as well, and that you want to use them and that you can use them. And Father, I pray for those who are here today who have, who have not answered that call but have walked into this relationship with you, that you will give them the strength and the courage and the wisdom and the power to take that step. God, it's been done before, and we want to do it with you again. We want it to start right here. We want to start right now. And it's all because of Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.